Okay. Good morning, everybody. Can you all hear us? Yeah. Okay. Um, we have a, a small group today, so um, it'd be great if everybody could just introduce themselves and um, tell us where you are. Start with uh, Becky. Hi, I'm Becky Bailey with Nevada Rural Hospital Partners. Good morning. Good morning. Rural. 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 Alan? Oh, can't hear you, Alan. How about now? Can you hear there me? There you go. Alan? Yep. Verizon and all. I'm Alan Fisk in Elko. I'm just here to eavesdrop on the technical properties. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Um, and R Roberta Andriazzi? Josie, I'm a psych nurse practitioner um, over in Elko at Vitality Integrated. Oh, yay. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. It's my first time. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. And uh, Dr. Koss? Hi, Michael Koss here, radiation oncologist, Reno, Nevada. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. So what? Yeah. So um, well, for um, we've got a newbie. Um, my name is Danica, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker at Northern Nevada Hopes, and I work in our MAT team. I'm Pete Ludlow. I'm the MAT nurse case manager at Northern Nevada Hopes, and I work with Danica and Crash, Dr. Robinson, and Carol with our MAT team. I'm Mark Broadhead, addiction psychiatrist at the VA Medical Center here in Reno. I'm Crash. I'm a pharmacist at Hopes, and I work with these guys. And um, Dr. Altenson and Carol are our two prescribers are not with us today um, because they had a training that they could not get out of, so they're not going to be here. Um, but I think we can think we can handle it. We'll see. Active shooter. Yeah, important stuff. Okay, so let's get started. We're going to be talking today about working with MAP patients. And for those of you who are already um, working with these folks, you know, they're kind of a, a special population. So um, they get some, some special rules. Um, okay, so um, this just to start out, I just kind of made these these ten rules to to go through. So I'll read them to you, and then we'll go through each one, and we can talk about them. Um, and you guys, you know, we really prefer this to be interactive as much as possible. So if you have any thoughts that come up, or ideas, or questions, or comments, or whatever, um, please feel free to jump in. So uh, number one, doing a, a self assessment of our attitudes creating a culture of compassion, learning how to be realistic about this population, um, knowing and kind of understanding what your role is and what our limits are in working with these folks, um, owning your feelings, watch your mouth. We'll talk a little bit about the language that we use, what to say, what not to say. Um, do not get into power struggles. Um, this is one that I kind of harp on every time is learning about how to use motivational enhancement techniques or motivational interviewing. Um, if you don't know, ask and also practicing self care. All right. Cool. So, number one, do a, do a self assessment of your attitudes. Uh, what are the attitudes, beliefs, values about addiction? Uh, or drug use in general. There's a lot of stigma out there. Uh, do you know or love someone who struggles with addiction? How has this app impacted you in your own life? And kind of understanding a lot of uh, you know where you're coming from in an approach and teaching someone with addiction, how that's impacted your own life is can very easily get in the way of how you might be treating a patient. So it's very very important to kind of check that at the door and just assume that every patient is different. Uh, so what is your own substance use or abuse history? 
Uh, how has this shaped your attitudes? I got clean on my own. Why can't this person get clean? That's a little too rigid. Why can't you get clean? I got clean just by going cold turkey. And I know how difficult it is. This person needs more leniency. And that can be a little too enabling. So hopefully some of those make sense. This will come up a lot in your own interaction with patients with addiction. All of us have somebody, we know somebody, we've been through it ourselves. Sometimes we think we know all the answers having gone through it ourselves. Generally, that's far from the truth. So learning how to check your emotions, not wearing them on your sleeve when you come in your door, and uh, having a very neutral approach is important. And if you, you know, if you find, well, as you're kind of thinking about this for yourself, um, or if you notice that you have a lot of things coming up and working with these patients, it's really important that you address those things and get help um, so that those things don't get in the way of your treatment and interfere with patient outcomes. Um, so create a culture of compassion. So we really do have to start where the patient is and have realistic expectations and not supposed to say see rule number three. So sorry about that. Which, Number three is about being realistic. So, but we do, we have to really recognize um, where these patients are on an individual basis and meet them there. Um, give patients trust on the front end, but verify. Um, we want to create a, an, an environment for them where they feel like they can be trusted because probably for most, in most arenas of their life, they're not. Um, they've probably burned a lot of bridges, created a lot of mistrust. And so we want to give them that on the front end as much as possible, but at the same time, make sure that we're verifying what they're telling us is true to the best of our ability. Don't talk about patients with other staff, especially if you're in a supervisory role, obviously, um, because that just creates, um, you know, an attitude that it's okay to do that. Um, and it's not. Um, using person-centered language, which we will talk more about when we get to um, the rule about watching your mouth. Um, checking your, or keeping your own motivations in check. So going back to like your own stuff. So when, um, when you notice, you know, something's coming up, make sure you're thinking, thinking through what it is that you're about to say before you say it. This is like kindergarten stuff, right? You can do this. Um, and taking time for self-care, which will be its own rule at the end of um, the presentation today, um, because it's really, really important that we're taking care of ourselves so that we can um, sort of create that environment outside of ourselves um, and for the people that we work with, for our coworkers, and also for patients. Roberta, I have a question for you. Can I, can I throw a question at you? Yeah. So at Vitality, um, you probably see a lot of the patients uh, coming back over and over again. Is that true? Correct. Well, um, I've been in, at the RN level for 15 years, so I just graduated from Gonzaga um, as a master's level. So Congratulations. Thanks. Um, so it's a transition for me, but yes, you're correct. I, there's been a lot of recidivism. So I've um, been an RN at this, you know, psych nurse for the state of Nevada for, I did four, 13, 14 years there, um, concurrently with Vitality Center. I specialized in acute detox for, this is my 15th year with them. So yes, to answer your question. Great, yeah. So have you, so, so being in this field for a long time, have you ever witnessed kind of the damage that sometimes gossip can do as far as talking about patients, maybe other staff members talking about them and how that can affect them? Sure, they often will leave I mean, they'll, it disrupts their, um, you know, treatment or, or they'll leave. Um, a lot of times that happens even in the ER. Right. Yeah. So we, we, re we recently had a patient that had to go to the ER because she had an abscess and she got admitted to the hospital because she had a really bad infection. And I actually went to go see her there just to check on her and see how her care was going, when she was going to be coming back, set up her follow-up appointment. And while I was in her hospital room, the nurse was outside the door, literally just outside the door. I could hear them talking and saying, 
I don't even know why he's here spending so much time with her. She's just going to walk out the door and stick a needle in her arm again. We're wasting our resources. Yeah. Horrible. And we both heard that together. And I just, I mean, I just cringe and I could just see it crush her. I mean, right there in front of us. And, and that can be very damaging. When you work in this field for a long time, it can get exhausting and you can get burnout and this can happen. You can very easily walk out and go, this is ridiculous. We're, we're just wasting our time or this person is this. They've always been doing this. They're just a liar. Addicts always lie, you know, or something like that. It's, it's easy to get caught up in that sometimes if you haven't really been able to, you know, check yourself at the door and walk in fresh. So yeah. thanks for your comments. That's, that's good. So number three, be realistic. Addiction is chronic. A relapsing disease uh, relapse is part of recovery. If we become punitive or punishing while treating patients, they are less likely to engage. They know it's chronic. They know they've relapsed lots of times. They don't need to be knocked down again and again and again. You know, if they, if they come across someone that, it's just like, oh, well, we've been through this before, so we're going to just not prescribe to you this time. Patients in active addiction lie, cheat, steal, manipulate to get what they need. Manipulation has worked for them for a long time. It's a survival skill. We cannot expect them to suddenly stop these behaviors without them learning other ways to get their needs met. Right, which is part of, um, you know, why it is so important that they are engaged in a recovery program. So they're in therapy or they're going to groups, they're going into meetings because they need to replace those sort of, um, you know, survival skills or manipulation skills with other ways. They need to learn how to communicate what, they, what it is that they want and they need without trying to get it through the back door. Um, so knowing your role and your limits. So this is really about um, a lot about boundaries and you know making sure that we're not trying to to be to be the be all and the end all for everybody. Um, we cannot treat this disease alone. Medication assisted treatment is medication assisted treatment. It's not treatment. It's part of a broader program. Um, recovery is multifaceted. It has you know there are, there are lots of components. It has to do with them you know, working or being productive and having a support system, um, being in therapy, um, making new friends who are clean and sober. Um, it's, it's a much broader picture than just taking medication. When a patient does have a relapse, it is not, we don't take that on. That's not our responsibility. Um, sometimes patients want us to think it is, um, that manipulation piece or just an inability for them to recognize or to acknowledge their own role. But we don't get to take responsibility for that. And sometimes it's hard not to when we, um, we invest a lot of time and energy into someone and they do have a relapse. It's hard not to, to take some of that on sometimes. And also on that note, we will not work harder than the patient. If we're working harder than the patient, they're not gonna be successful. And we keep trying harder and harder and we try to rescue them, but um, that never works, ever, ever, ever. Um, and so making sure that you're um, mindful of that and that you're not doing more than they are. And it doesn't mean that they don't care and it doesn't mean that they're not going to be successful. Um, it means that maybe they need, we need to shift their program in some way because what, what we're doing isn't working. Uh, we must maintain professional and ethical boundaries, as you all know this. Um, but a lot of people that do work um, with people who struggle with addiction do burn out. Because either we have boundaries that are too rigid, and so we have unrealistic expectations, um, or we have boundaries that are too diffuse, and we're getting back into that rescuer, rescuer role. Um, so making sure that... Um, you know, we're finding the right balance of being supportive and but also not being um, being a rescuer. And also super important to just be aware, and you'll hear me kind of say this a lot because I think it's so important 
to just constantly be mindful of what's going on with ourselves. Um, so day to day, moment to moment, patient to patient, making sure that we're not letting our own stuff come up and interfere with um, the way that we're treating people. Can everyone see this triangle? Because on, on, on my screen it didn't pop up, but I just want to make sure everyone else can see the triangle. Yeah, okay. So this is this is uh, kind of a thing that I adopted. It's, it's not really new. You can find this in a lot of different uh, treatment centers. Uh, I, I've worked in several different residential treatment centers with adolescents, and the staff that we would hire, this was one of the first things that I would always go over with them. And Ideally, if you're going to work in mental health or with addiction or, 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 or I mean, even in health in, in general, uh, it's always great to have these professional boundaries like this. And this is how I like to explain it. It is very easy to swing to one of these extremes as a provider or even as like a mental health tech or even at the front desk, the secretary. Uh, everybody that's involved with interacting with the patients when they come in the door from the moment they come in and when they're leaving everybody has to be consistent and we have to find this balance in the middle and one of the reasons this is so important is because a lot of these patients in their home environment this is what they were getting at home they had a parent that was a punisher was way over the top was very maybe like in the military and was do this, do this, do this, or you're going to lose this, lose this. And it was like threatening type of behavior. Or they had someone at home that was enabling them, enabling their behavior. And okay, well, just this one time, I'll let you do this. And, and then you got the, and then you got another side of like rescuing them. You got one parent that is trying to set boundaries and be consistent. And you might have another parent that is rescuing their child. And that creates this bipolar swing in the kids and they learn to manipulate the system by giving exactly which one of these, what, what they want to hear, or they know how to turn it on, turn it off for certain people. And that only enables their behavior and they get worse and it actually will drive their addiction, especially. Um, so it's important to find a balance in the middle and you have to teach this to all of your staff. It's very easy to have um, you know, someone who's struggling and, and maybe the, the doctor is being very strict about like setting the rules, reminding them of like a contract that they've signed. And that's not being a punisher. That's just reminding them of the professionalism that we have and, and letting them, reminding the patient of their own responsibilities. And you could have an MA that walks in after that and could be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe how she was talking to you. That was so mean. Don't worry. You're doing so good. That just undermines everything that we're trying to build and establish that relationship with the patient. So I like this little triangle here. Um, there's, there's other models out there that, that can throw in different words there. Um, this is one that I've just always used with training staff and all the facilities that I've had and working with, with uh, this type of kind of patient level. Okay. All right, so owning your feelings. Our feelings are our own and we get to own them. Lucky us. Um, so oftentimes you'll, you'll have these emotional experiences of you meet with a patient and they say or do something and we get really angry or we feel really disappointed, like perhaps with a relapse. Um, so we have to recognize that those are our feelings and that patients don't make us feel any type of way. So if you do find yourself sort of getting some kind of emotional response or having some kind of flooding when you're interacting with a patient, it's really just an opportunity for you to say, you know, to pause and to say, to, to reflect on what's going on. Um, because oftentimes if we're having that kind of emotional response, it's really not necessarily about that particular interaction. It's usually something broader. Um, but it's just important to be mindful of not to say that we shouldn't get angry or we shouldn't feel disappointed because those are normal things. Um, but just to be mindful of where that's coming from. And really important to remember that we can only be manipulated if we allow it. These patients are going to manipulate. They just are, um, like we talked about before. And so just 
you make sure that you're listening to your gut. And I know you guys all know this, but always a good reminder to just pay attention, um, listen to your spidey sense. Um, just be careful with that. Yeah, so uh, to watch your mouth a little bit, like when you're using language around these patients, this is this can always be a tough one. It can get you into trouble a little bit, and and using judgmental uh, language that uh, is is demeaning uh, sometimes in nature. Um, just and, and also part of like what what she was just saying, patients' behaviors do not make us angry. A lot of times, you can. Uh, if you catch yourself in your head saying, why is this patient doing this to me? Why do they always act this way with me? I don't see them act like that with anybody else. That right there is like, whoo, red flag. They're not really doing it to you. And that's your own emotions kind of getting involved in that. And, and that's right there where you can kind of say, okay, wait, they're not really doing it to me. I don't think they are. <laughs> Maybe they are. Maybe, maybe they, they really don't. They like learned it. that they can get away with it. Right, but you know, maybe they want you to feel like that. But you have you have to be very careful with that. And so you can catch yourself feeling like that, and then all of a sudden, bleh, something comes out, and you're like, oh, that that probably wasn't really what I wanted to say or, or do. And that's where a watch your mouth comes into play. Uh, so important use person first language. Patient who struggles with addiction rather than an addict. Uh, maybe talking amongst ourselves sometimes, I mean, we can use that as a term, addicts struggle with this behavior. Um, in general, it's best to use kind of like someone who's struggling with an addiction. Don't use stigmatizing terms, junkie, addict, abuser, drug seeker. Drug seeker is a very common word that we use a lot and probably very common down in the pharmacy. Does that happen a lot, Crush? So in the pharmacy, you probably get them coming back over and over again, and you, and you know that they're drug-seeking. But using those kind of terms probably isn't going to come across very well. Uh, dirty, as in a positive drug screen. Ooh, I'm kind of guilty of that. <laughs> I know. That's, that's, that's a tough one right there. Dirty or clean, because we might have to clean up the way that we, we communicate that, because I always come back and I'm it's like, yeah, they're clean. Practice. And I'm like, ooh, wait, yeah. Dirty and clean, uh, yeah. So those, that could be, you know, confused with like good and bad, and, and then that leads to shame, and you know, and I'm a bad person, I'm dirty, my urine was dirty. Yeah, so that shaming cycle there. So I, I, I can see how that can be very important. So we'll use positive for methamphetamine instead. <laughs> or you can say they pop hot. That's always a fun. Oh, they pop hot. <laughs> They're hot. Uh, habit implies there is simply a lack of willpower. Um, maybe struggling with addiction is probably a better way to say that. Habits, I mean, there are certain ways that you can use that. There are ways, you know, that we have habits that we need to break. Sometimes in this population, they can take that as something like, well, I just, you know, that just means, you know, I, I, I lack the willpower to ever, like, overcome these things. Um, so I already mentioned this, don't use shame, guilt, fear-mongering to coerce into compliance. Uh, don't you love your children enough to get clean for them? If you don't stop using, you will be dead within six months. These are both real things yeah. that patients have told me they've been told. Yeah. That, that's very common. Don't you love your children enough to want to quit? Ooh, that, that one really stings. It can be true, but it, but it just... It just sends them into that cycle of shame. I'm worthless. I'm never going to get over this. I can't even quit for my own children. Like, so you can see kind of like where that goes. Families who, you know, so you, you can teach this to families as well. And like uh, family members who are struggling with, with members who have addiction, they, they can go to Al-Anon. And, and in Al-Anon, they teach a lot about using this type of language. And, and trying to be careful as far as like what you're saying to them and engaging in power struggles back and forth and saying things that can shame them and it just drives them away and you think that you're trying to help them. Sure, it makes sense. Uh, well, you would think that if you loved your children enough, you, would, you, know, you wouldn't be using. Makes sense, but not, not in this case. It's generally not gonna be therapeutic. 
Any, I just want to pause really quick. Any questions or comments or anything from anyone? Just want to check in. Nothing. Okay. All right, so this is a tough one for a lot of people. Um, whether, you know, you tend to be, because most of us tend, we all have a tendency towards being either too rigid or too naked. That's just kind of how it goes when you work with these folks. So um, this, this can be difficult. So getting into arguments or confrontations with clients <coughs> or patients is not helpful. Um, they're gonna be less likely to engage and you're gonna get really frustrated um, because you're probably not gonna win. Um, and it's really important to keep in mind that when patients are coming into treatment, even when they've been in treatment, and ambivalence is normal. It's normal. Any kind of change process, there's always going to be ambivalence. And so it's important to, to have that in mind and to, and to be aware of that when you're having conversations with patients. So when ambivalence comes up, you don't get frustrated by it because it's normal. Um, and the relationship that you have with your patients is really the most powerful tool. Um, for them to be able to stay engaged in treatment and to, you know, work towards long-term recovery. So be mindful of that and, and the ways that you can first build an alliance, build that relationship with them, and how to maintain it in a way that's healthy. Um, so being empathetic, supportive, but also directive is, is really, those are the key, kind of the key components of having that healthy, supportive relationship with them so that they do stay engaged so they keep coming back um and so yeah just making sure that you're mindful of those things we you know we do see this sometimes where you know we i'm sure all of you are familiar with this where you have somebody who is like really trying and really motivated to be in treatment and then you know, they have some sort of interaction with somebody who is involved in their recovery program, who's a support person, and that can really throw people off. Um, so important. So this one has a video, and I think maybe what we should do is just finish the rest of the slides, and then if we have time, go back. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. Do you want? Do you want to do motivation? Yeah. So um, I know you. I know for you guys who, who've been coming that. I probably sound like a broken record, but I just, this is so important. Um, if you're not familiar with motivational and interviewing, um, please, please, please think about um, learning a little bit about it because it is, it's, you know, it's, it's really our, our most effective tool that we have in working with these folks to move them towards recovery. Um, this is it's just very effective. It's also very, very, very effective for other, um, for other medical um, issues that are behaviorally based. So I think other things like diabetes or asthma, chronic, chronic illnesses where there's a behavioral component involved, um, this can be really helpful for that as well. Um, so just kind of these are the really the basic tenets of motivational interviewing um, are using empathy and reflective listening. So making sure that you're engaged with the patient, that you're hearing them, that you're allowing them the space to um, to say what it is that they need to say or kind of, um, you know, vent or whatever it is in that moment. Um, and then we're working on developing discrepancy between what their goals are. So what is it that they, what is it that's important to them? What is it that motivates them? Um, and how their current behavior, the behaviors that they're currently engaging, how those two things don't align. Um, so it's not telling them what they're doing is wrong or bad. It's saying, well, you're telling me one thing that this is what's important to you. And yet at the same time, these are the behaviors that you're engaging in and those things don't line up. So it's sort of gently kind of shining the light on how that is not working for them. Um, again, avoiding argument and confrontation because that doesn't help. Nobody likes to be told what to do. And for everybody involved here today, if we get told what to do, most of us just automatically rebel, even if we know it's good for us, because it's human nature, because humans are weird. Um, so rolling with resistance. So when you do get resistance from a patient or a client in, a, in a, any kind of 
interaction is you roll with it initially. You don't put your hand up and say no, because again, that's gonna shut them down. So you roll with it on the front end, and then you come in the side door. That's the secret. Um, and just being supportive and, and being optimistic and being that cheer, in that cheerleader role to some degree. Um, so th these are just kind of the, the basics of it, just to give you a little flavor. And then I have this little video clip that if we have time, we can watch. That's a nice example of what that looks like. This is a good one to, um, I mean, obviously not only for yourself, but if you have staff in your office, in the clinic, uh, front office staff or anybody that's interacting with the patient, if they don't know the answer to something, try to encourage them not to say something like, yeah, sure, I think we could probably do that. Or, yeah, the doctor will probably increase your dose today. Uh, sometimes that can get us into a little bit of trouble. So working with your staff to make sure that those kinds of things are consistent, um, using a you know an approach of, you know what, let's – let's consult with everybody else and let's find out what, you know, what we're going to do with that and then make a decision. So if something comes up that you're, unsure, you know, unsure how to handle or you feel like the pieces are not fit, fitting together, ask for help. Get consultation, attend an echo clinic. If you aren't sure what a patient means, ask them to clarify. You know, you might have a patient that comes in after the weekend and they might be talking about eight balls and you think they're talking about billiards. They are definitely not talking about playing pool. They are talking about eight ball to certain certain uh, amount of uh, a drug. I can't even remember what it is combination. anymore. <laughs> combination of drug. 3.5 grams. What is it? 3.5 grams. 3.5 grams. One eighth of an ounce. One eighth of an ounce. So yeah, so I went through an eight ball this weekend. Oh, really? That, that must have been a lot of fun. Were your friends there too? Yeah. No, it, that. So be humble. Um, we and let me jump in. And not only just, just like, um, you know, if a, if a patient tells you, yeah, I, I used, you know, two points or whatever, right? So not only if you don't know what that means, ask, but also if you don't know what that means to that particular patient, right? Like, well, is that typical for you? Is that more than normal for you? So make sure that you're clarifying and that you – you know, especially, I think it's kind of natural and normal when somebody starts telling you something and you don't necessarily know what they're talking about, but you don't want to be like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, we get kind of like self-protective. <laughs> I know what I'm doing. Um, but it is really important. Um, if you don't know what they mean, please ask. And my, in my experience, most of them are very willing to explain that. And a lot of times when they're saying that they're using two points, and you, and you ask them that, how much are you using? To, you know, they might say two points. That might be two points every three hours. So <laughs> clarify that. Two points a day or two points every three or four hours because there's a big difference there. And when you can't seem to get your patient's dose right, that might go back to that. Uh, so being humbly, culturally competent, we must be culturally humble. Or not being culturally competent, sorry. Right. I, I just, I put this because this got pounded into my head in graduate school by a professor. Um, but just, we can't be culturally competent. We use that, people use that all the time. But competency sort of implies that we know everything. And culture is so fluid um, that if, if you don't know, you have to find that humility to be able to ask. Because what one thing means to one person might not mean the same to somebody else. Another example of this language thing is like dope, right? Heroin addicts call heroin dope. People who don't use heroin don't call it dope. They call it other things. Um, people of an older generation refer to marijuana as dope. So you really have to make sure that you're asking um, and clarifying. I don't remember. Sure. So practicing self-care. Compassion for self creates more space to have compassion for others. Take the time for ourselves and practice good self-care in order to be present, mindful, and engaged with our patients. We cannot give to others what we do not have. So do you use any 
self-care practices? Do you guys have any methods of, of doing that yourself? What do you do, Roberta? Jim, I used to. I, I haven't, since I moved back, been as diligent, but that was my big deal. Going to the gym, always, always helpful. What do you do, Dr. Whitney? Roger. Woodhead? Uh, <laughs> uh, for me, one of the best things I can do for myself is set limits. Um, we use a, uh, a nurse to see all of our suboxone patients first. Uh, and his work hours are different than my work hours. Uh, and I'm usually doing five different things while they're seeing patients. Uh, and um, so if one of the patients wants to come in early or come in late or come in when I'm supposed to be doing something else, um, the nurse might want to work him in. But I see very firm boundaries. Well, he wants to see you now. Well, he may want to see me, but he cannot see me. Um, this is when I work. These, this is part of the routine. Um, and that's for a multitude of reasons, not the least of which is making sure that uh, manipulations, most of which are unconscious at that particular point in time, um, you know, are dealt with. Here are the rules. We obey the rules. We always obey the rules. And uh, if... Um, somebody wants to go around the rules, we don't beat them, but we tell them no and that's it. No means no. Uh, and there's no emotional repercussions, but no means no. Uh, but it's also for me. So, I mean, the only thing I have is my time. And so I protect my time, I take care of my time, and as a result, when I do give my time, I feel more free about it. I don't feel resentful that, you know, this guy's taking my time. So, um, uh, you know, these are the hours, that's when I'm there, this is what I do when I'm there, and it keeps my mindset right. Um, so they don't come in all uh, pissed off, ready to get pissed on. Um, you know, it's, uh, I, I can roll with the flow a lot easier. Um, so setting, just making sure I set boundaries and um, expect people to try to break them and um, be good to myself in terms of keeping them firm. Nice. One of, the th one of the things about, I like about this is this not only applies to you at your practice with your patients, this is also going to protect you in your personal life with your family at home or friends because I will often come home and if I have not really like paused for a moment after a day of working really hard and dealing with a lot of different issues, if I don't pause for a minute to kind of like bring myself back to the moment, I will walk in the door and I don't even know, I'm, I'm not even aware of, of how my tone is, how it's coming across to my wife, my kids, and all they're wanting to do is just like, show me something that they drew that day. And I'm like, give me a second, I'm trying to put my stuff away, or like, let me get undressed first. And all they, all they want, they've been waiting all day just to see me and like jump on me and play with me. And I am like, Ugh. like give me some space. So it is great to do self-care before you even get home, before you go out with friends, do any of that. That is so crucial. And that's something that we've been talking about lately. We have been growing super fast and our influx of patients is going faster than we can handle it. And I'm doing, I'm doing cartwheels in my sleep just thinking about how I'm going to balance like the next day with the schedule. And in my end, taking a shower and I'm like thinking about my patients and I'm going, what is going on? I'm like, this is not fair. I'm like, I can't do this to myself. I can't do this to my family. So make sure that you set those limits. You got to have time to yourself. Like he's saying, and I mean, go to the spa, go to the pepper mill or something and get a, <laughs> get a massage and get, get a Just manicure, a pedicure, do whatever you got to do. It, sometimes it sounds silly, but you have to do it to keep your sanity and for you to, in order to be able to go back and give your all to your patients. Really, uh, Dr. Koss, do you have a comment? He had his hand raised earlier. I did not. No, I, he took his off. Uh, I just, I just saw that, but maybe not. Okay. All right. 
Okay, so let me ask you guys. Um, I have this. We we have this video clip. Would you guys rather do more like question and answers? Do you guys have questions, or do you want to watch the clip? What do you guys? How are you feeling? Do anybody have any questions or like clients they need to talk about or anything that they're struggling with? How to approach a client? Do you have anybody that has borderline personality disorder that's like very difficult to work with? I'll give up. Oh, okay. Okay. Karen, hey, hey, nurse this afternoon. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So, how are you feeling? Oh, okay, it burns a little bit, but I'm just waiting for the doctor to check my stitches and then I'm going home. Well, that's great. That's um, it's a good thing that you're going home soon. Mm -hmm. um, I have 10 minutes that I can maybe sit down and talk with you. If you have any concerns or questions for me, um, is there anything that you'd like to talk to me about? Um, not really, but honestly, this has been really bugging me. This priest came in here and gave me this flyer for AA. And I'm kind of offended. Like, why would he give this mm -hmm. to me? I don't know. So just bothers me. So you're saying that uh, a priest came by and mm -hmm. gave you this brochure for Alcoholic Anonymous. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's this is really upsetting you because you don't think that you need. I'm not an alcoholic. You don't believe that you're an alcoholic. No. no. I, I mean, I could understand how upset you can be if people think that you're something that you're not. Right? Um, would you like us to explore a bit more about, uh, you know, why you th why do you think that the priest gave you this? Do you have any ideas why he would hand you such, like, a brochure like this? Well, I mean, I guess it kind of makes sense because I'm here because I got into a bar mm -hmm. fight, right? And I got hurt. So maybe he just thought, you know, bar fight, she's got to be a drunk. Maybe that's what he thought. I don't know. Okay. So um, would you like to tell me a, a bit more about this bar fight that you... I, honestly, I don't remember much because mm -hmm. I know I was drinking, I was having some fun with my friends, but I think, I guess this girl just got to me and, and sometimes I I get a little crazy and I don't know what happened, but mm -hmm. I know I hurt now. So you got into a bar fight, right? And and you you were drunk. You, yeah, you were I was scared. Oh yeah. And you didn't know what was really going on, but you know, nope. you just think that maybe this girl was um, not saying something good to you and then you got into this fight yeah okay um would you like would you allow me to explore a little bit more about the drinking and, and then alcohol it's okay. just like okay okay um so how does alcohol affect you like what what does it do for you is there like i like it it's fun i go out with my friends and we go drinking and like after work it's like the best way to just chill mm -hmm. you know is to have a beer or just relax. So for me, it's fun, and it's my way of just relaxing and hanging out with my friends. Yeah, I understand. So you you like having fun with your friends. Drinking is a normal thing for you guys to do. Yeah. And you don't see a problem with what you're doing with your friends. Like yeah. you're just drinking. At 25, and... I'm not driving. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, yeah, it's just fun. So it seems to me that drinking is not really a, a problem that you in your life right now. No. Um, but would you say though that there are some negative effects that, that alcohol is doing in your life right now? Is, would you like to tell me if it's, if it's affecting you in that way? Well, I mean, I, I'm kind of cut up, so that's not a good thing mm -hmm. related to my drinking. Mm -hmm. I guess Joey, he's my boyfriend. Mm -hmm. He really doesn't like it when I drink, mm -hmm. and we get into a lot of fights, and he, he says I'm just not normal when I drink. So I guess that would be the negative stuff. So, like you said, your friends drink, you drink, and it's just f something fun. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, on the bad side, it's affecting your relationship with your boyfriend. Uh, he does not like it, the, the way you act when you're drinking. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, it is affecting um, the relationship negatively. Okay? Um, so, back on the um, Alcoholic Anonymous, if you don't mind. Um, so, we, what do you know about AA? It's, it's a meeting for people who drink. Mm -hmm. Talk about it. Okay, so and you're not on the you're on the right track about you know the people meeting. And it's a group of people um, that talk about um, alcohol. 
Um, okay, so with your boyfriend, it sounds to me that he's, would you say he's, uh, how important is he in your life? He's, I'm going to marry that guy. He's important. We're going to have a life together. Okay, so that's great. You know, at least you're thinking about a future with Joey and you think that he's really important in your life right now. Um, and then you also said that he does not agree with the drinking. I would like to ask you this question. Now, would you be willing to take it a step further and maybe check out, check out one of these programs for the sake of your relationship? Is, is that something that you're willing to look at? I'm willing to. In the future? Yeah. I've never thought of it before, but mm -hmm. I'm willing. Um, so, okay, I, I would like to give you a scale of 1 to 10. In a scale of 1 to 10, how likely would you go and, and check out one of these programs? Maybe and 6. 6 out of 10? So you would say it's a 6. That's very surprising because it's not a 1. Like, it, it's, it's very good. Why would you say it's not a 1 and it's a 6 that you're likely to go? Because of Joey, like, I, he doesn't like me drinking. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm only 25. It's mm -hmm. not affecting my health now, but I know it, when I get older, mm -hmm. it could really affect my health. And Joey wants to have babies, and he keeps telling me I can't drink um, if I want to get pregnant. So, I mean, those are the things. Th that's really, I, I commend you for that. You're thinking about a future with Joey. You're thinking that maybe you'll have children with him someday. And if you do try, you think that it will um, make your relationship better. It will mm -hmm. affect your relationship in a good way. How would, well, well, you said it's a six, right? So what do you think would happen or would need to happen to make it a nine for you? Like you're really like most likely to just go in and try one of these programs. Well, I guess like if the place was close mm -hmm. and if I liked the people there and if I got something out of it, then it would make me go. Okay, that sounds good. Um, it sounds reasonable that if it's closer to you, it's easier for you to stop by. Yeah. Um, if you'd like, if you're interested, I would be able to help you find a, a place, a closer area wherein the program is held and it's easier for you to, to get there. It's closer to your house. Would you be willing to find out a bit more about that? Sure, yeah. Okay, so um, and thank you for talking to me about this, uh, about your relationship with Joey and how alcohol is maybe affecting your relationship and, you know, and you're maybe willing to go and try one of these programs. Um, would you like to meet up with me in the next two weeks and see how, how this program is to you, like if you've tried it, if you have any more questions or concerns for me, look at where you are at in this. Um, situation is that something in two weeks? Yeah, in two weeks. Yeah, I would yeah, do it to. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, Leanne. Um, this is a big step for you, I know, and it's hard to make a, a step like this. But I'm thankful that we have this talk today, and and I hope to see you again soon in Great. two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. Um, any final questions? No. Well, we really appreciate you guys being here today. Um, it's nice. Nice to have a new face too. Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Bert. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye, bye.